Hello. I didn't study chemistry at school, so ever since I've been quizzing, I've felt like I'm playing catch up with loads of the other quizzers who did. Now, in a previous video, we've already looked at the periodic table and some of the things you need to know about it. But in this video, we're going to look at how understanding how the periodic table is constructed can help you work your way to answers. We've got 82 facts in this video to help you improve your quizzing and understand the periodic table and the chemical elements better. So let's go with part two of our video on the periodic periodic table of elements. As we mentioned in part one, the elements are arranged in the periodic table. Knowing where an element is can be as important as knowing details about the element. One of the most common element classifications is their group, or the column they are in on the table. Of these, the most likely groups to come up in a quiz are the two at either end of the table, groups 1 and 2, and 17 and 18. These groups usually have names, for example, groups 17 are known as the halogens. Elements in the same group also have similar chemical properties. For example, the halogens form acidic fumes when they react with hydrogen. Knowing these groups and the elements in them as well as their common properties is useful knowledge for any quizzer. The rows of the periodic table, known as periods, while also good to know are less useful than the groups. However, it might be worth knowing that the lanthanides are in period six and the actinides are in period seven. As well as groups, elements are divided into blocks based on their electron configurations. The periodic table is divided into four blocks, and these are easy to see from the table. The elements from scandium to copernicium are known as the D-block elements. The only oddity is helium, which despite its position, is an S-block element. Now let's look at some of the groupings on the periodic table. There is no single agreed definition of the groups on the periodic table. For example, we've included helium in with the noble gases because it is a noble gas, but it's also quite clearly, understanding its properties, a non-metal. So if you understand these commonly used groupings and the properties of the chemical elements, you'll be able to place the elements correctly. Actinides. The actinides are metallic elements that comprise elements 89 through to 103. They get their name from actinium, the first element in the series. They are also often called the F elements because they have valence electrons in the F shell. And if you know what that means, then you probably don't need this video. Alkali metals. The alkali metals make up the first column or group of the periodic table and comprise lithium through to francium. They're called alkali metals because they easily form compounds that dissolve in water to give basic or alkaline solutions. The members of this group are lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium and francium. Hydrogen is technically in the same group, although it really doesn't exhibit the same behaviour as the true alkali metals. Alkaline earth metals. The alkaline earth metals make up the second column or group of the periodic table, from beryllium through to radium. Scientists used to call elements that were non-metallic, water insoluble and fire resistant, earths. In actual fact, these elements were compounds composed of a metal and oxygen. Later, these compounds were renamed oxides. The metal components of the oxides behaved differently but still resembled the alkali family metals. The two concepts were combined to create the name we now know them by, alkaline earth metals. Halogens. The halogen elements are a subset of the non-metals. They comprise group 17 of the periodic table, from fluorine through to astatine, and since 2016, tennessine. The term halogen means salt former. Halogens are reactive. Fluorine, the first in the list, is by far the most reactive and combines with nearly all of the other elements from the periodic table. As we move down the group 7 column, the halogens decrease in reactivity. Halogens are also toxic. Lanthanides. The lanthanides comprise elements 57 through to 71 and take their name from lanthanum, the first in the list. Along with actinides, they are also called F elements. Metalloids. Metalloids are also called semi-metals. They're the elements boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium, and polonium. These elements are neither metals nor non-metals, but they do share some properties with both groups. Metals are good conductors. This means heat and electricity can flow through them easily. Non-metals are not good conductors. The metalloids, as they are called, can sometimes act as a conductor, while at other times they can't. This ability to turn on or turn off conductivity is the basis of being a semiconductor. And currently most semiconductor devices are composed of silicon. Metals. A metal is a substance that conducts heat and electricity, is shiny and can be hammered into sheets or drawn into wire. Metals occupy the left side of the periodic table. Good examples of metals that we're all familiar with are iron, silver and sodium. Noble gases. 
The noble gases comprise group 18. They're generally very stable, colorless, and odorless. The noble part of their name actually arises from the German word edelgas, which means unreactive. Helium is the second most abundant element in our universe and was discovered on the sun before it was found on Earth. It, along with neon, is one of two elements that have never been observed to bond with another element in a compound. Organesson is the first artificial element to be classed as a noble gas. Nonmetals. The term nonmetals is used to classify the elements hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, oxygen, sulfur, and selenium, which don't neatly fit anywhere else, but obviously other elements such as the noble gases are also nonmetals. These elements have properties that are more varied than their metallic cousins. Some are solids at room temperature, such as carbon, while others, such as helium and oxygen, are gases. Nonmetals tend to be poor conductors of heat and electricity. Transition metals. The transition elements are metals that have a partially filled D subshell, and they comprise groups 3 through to 12, and the lanthanides and the actinides. Almost all of the D block elements are transition metals, but a few, such as zinc, do not count as transition metals due to the ions they form. Now, as well as knowing about those groups we just talked about, there are other properties that you need to know about. One useful thing to know is the state of each element at room temperature. Most of the elements are solid at room temperature, which is about 25 degrees C, but a couple of elements, like mercury, are liquid, and a few are gases. Knowing these states of matter can also help you remember the uses for each element. For example, the gas in light bulbs is usually argon. But even if you didn't know this, knowing which elements are gases rules out most of the other elements already. There are some handy strings of elements where their names are going to help you out. If you know uranium is element 92, then you get 3 for the price of 1, as Neptunium is 93 and Plutonium is 94. That's the order of the planets, well, until Pluto was demoted anyway. Berkeley, being in California, gives you elements 97 and 98, Berkelium and Californium. There's a run of scientists from 99 onwards, Einstein, Fermi, Mendeleev, Nobel, Lawrence and Rutherford. Coming back to the structure of the periodic table, if you have some elements and their atomic numbers locked in your mind, you can use them as reference points to make educated guesses. Atomic numbers in the first three periods are separated by 8 each time, and the next two periods by 18. So you can do some deduction, even if you don't know the atomic number itself. For example, if you get asked about element 35, you might subtract 18, then 8, and reason it's the same group as 17 and 9, chlorine and fluorine. So it's another halogen, and at least you're going to be guessing something like bromine or iodine, as long as you know what the halogens are. So the key thing is not to see the periodic table as a list to be memorized, but as a diagram that has a structure for a reason. If you understand the logic in its very basic terms, you can break up the periodic table into manageable chunks. Start with the first three periods. Then take the halogens and noble gases vertically, noting the plus 8, 8, 18, 18, 32 pattern. Then do the same for alkali metals and alkaline earth metals. Once you have these secure, move on to the rest of P block, transition metals by period, actinides and post actinides, and you can safely leave the lanthanides to last. So, assuming you nailed all the things we told you to learn in the last video, here is your must, should and could. You must know groups, especially groups 1 and 2, 17 and 18. You need to know the non-metals, the metals and the metalloids, and you need to know which elements are liquids and which are gases. You should know the different blocks, S, P, D and F, and chemical properties associated with elements and groups of elements. And you could learn the non-transition metal D block elements and the periods. We hope you found this video useful and if there's anything you want us to cover in a future Quiz Academy video then please let us know in the comments below. And don't forget, if you've liked this video, click to subscribe and then you won't miss out on any of our future videos.